both payment or co-insurance rate rather than just finding quicker. That's kind of the interesting thing about Kaiser as well, though, is that you know they, the costs are fairly low, but they're also very generous in terms of like they have very low copayments in general. Um, so they've been able to sort of contain costs in spite of that fact, not because of it. Um, the downside, though, of course, of having copayments and co-insurance and so forth is that you are moving further away from a world of, of full insurance. So you're, you're basically transferring some of the risk onto the consumer. Um, now you know again, if it's like a modest amount of risk, it's totally unreasonable. Um, you know, if somebody can is able to afford a, an extra payment of like hundred thousand, hundred dollars, or thousand, thousand dollars during a uh, given year. Uh, you know, it, it may be sort of still. Ideally, they would like to insure against that, but uh, but that doesn't seem like a huge risk compared to say somebody who has like hundred thousand dollars in the stock market for their retirement portfolio that could easily lose like ten thousand dollars in a year if the market doesn't do that well. Um, so then uh, uh, the last sort of market failure, which we talked about a lot before in the class, but I think is not such an important issue in the healthcare market, uh, even though it is kind of like a you know a primary market failure in a lot of the other markets we thought about, uh, are externalities. So there certainly are cases in uh, healthcare where you have to worry about externalities, uh, but they're probably again not like the main source of market failure there. Um, so vaccinations are uh, certainly a case where you have externalities. Now it's actually as we discussed it's on the midterm, we're actually talking about like positive externalities rather than negative externalities. Uh, so if you're pricing the vaccination at like the cost of production, uh, then the vaccination rate should probably be too low uh, in expectation because people are only going to take into account whether the vaccine is going to, they're only taking out the private benefit of avoiding the illness when they get the vaccine for themselves, uh, but not necessarily taking into account that by not getting sick, they will also not spread the illness potentially to somebody else. Um, so this generates a free rider problem. You know, in particular, you can kind of see this with like the anti-vaccination movement of the people who think that vaccines cause autism or some other uh, strange disease. Uh, this is generally based on very poor causal reasoning of like, you know, uh, my kid turned three and they got vaccines and then later on they got autism and it turns out that autism just generally develops at that age, which is going to develop anyway. Uh, so, you know, there's not, there's no uh, evidence that this is true, uh, but that hasn't stopped sort of certain uh, communities in the country from, um, from being like, uh, from, from the idea that vaccines are harmful, uh, hasn't stopped that idea from, from catching on. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of at like a, so if you start out where you have like 100% or say 95% vaccination rate, uh, but actually the marginal like cost of not being vaccinated in that scenario is very low just because if everybody else around you is vaccinated, then you can essentially free ride on them. So that's where the free rider problem is coming in. Uh, that being said, you get you do get sort of clusters, oddly enough, in like sort of wealthier communities where uh, you know the, the vaccine rate might fall below 50%, uh, and then the then the herd immunity tends to decline. Uh, and at that point, you're actually like putting your kids at risk by not vaccinating them. Um, HIV is certainly another case where uh, there are externalities. I mean, literally, you know, like. Uh, you HIV positive and having unprotected sex, then you're going to impose like a very substantial externality on, uh, you know, on whoever your partner is. Um, in that case, you know, of course, the private cost of engaging in unsafe sex or needle sharing can be less than the social cost. Uh, that's particularly true for the infected. So we actually had a student here a few years ago, a graduate who's now a professor um, uh, at, um, uh, I think at Vassar. But uh, he had a paper that was looking at essentially people's reactions to a, how people responded to HIV uh, tests in um, it was in Africa, who's a basically development economist, but he did kind of health work. So he had, like, essentially, like, had an RCT where they had randomly assigned uh, HIV tests to some people and not to others, and then he looked at kind of what happened after people got the results back. And disturbingly enough, basically, so he did, you can't, in his case, like, you can't observe uh, sexual, like, risky sexual behavior because I mean, you can ask people about it, but as you would imagine, like, the, the reliability of those self-reports is notoriously bad. Um, but he did actually then, they had, like, blood draws later on, like, six months later or something, and so they could look at the presence of um, sort of other sexually transmit, transmitted diseases other than HIV and use that as kind of a proxy for uh, unsafe sex because presumably you're not going to develop those diseases if you're having sex, so you're certainly less likely to. Um, and so what he found, uh, somewhat disturbingly, is that essentially, like, uh, people who found out that they were positive ended up actually in more risky behavior than people who didn't who found out that they were negative. So the idea here is that essentially the private cost from the individual's perspective has now diminished once they know they're positive because they no longer face a risk of getting it from somebody else. Uh, whereas if you're negative, you're like, oh, geez, maybe I thought I was positive, but now that I know I'm negative, uh, I need to sort of protect my negative status and not get infected. Uh, and so you would continue to you know, practice uh, uh, safer behavior. So uh, that was kind of, I mean, that's kind of like an extreme uh, case, but you know, it's clearly a case where the uh, private costs are sort of dictating people's behaviors rather than the, the actual true social cost. Um, Drug development uh, is another case where there's externalities, uh, in particular, basically, you know, the, um, uh, this is well, I mean, basically, because we have a public good, right, that uh, this is something that's essentially non-rival. It's not necessarily non-excludable, uh, but it is non-rival in the sense that most of the costs are in these fixed development costs. So once you develop the drug, it's very, very cheap to just produce it, you know, mass produce it and give it to everybody who needs it. Uh, but if you just, uh, you know, mass produce it and, and charge marginal cost, uh, then you're never going to recoup the, the development uh, costs. So, uh, what we, you know, what we discussed earlier is that essentially what's sort of the status quo right now is that the U.S. pays like the majority of these costs, and then other countries that are sort of more organized uh, and have, have basically a single uh, purchaser of these drugs because the, you know, the, the government uh, is essentially purchasing them uh, in, those in those other countries uh, use their monopoly power there, you know, the market power to uh, negotiate lower prices and then can kind of free ride on the development uh, costs. Uh, the U.S. in comparison doesn't have a lot of control because the individual uh, is insured and all the individuals and the individual insurers have very little market power. Medicare does have market power, but by law it cannot negotiate uh, overprice. Um, so. Just to, just to finish up then, you know, there's a lot of market failures. In general, we're going to think that you're going to need some sort of government intervention when you're uh, you know, dealing with tons and tons of market failures. Uh, and I think this is a, the, a case where that's uh, certainly true. Um, so in the case of asymmetric information in the insurance market, which we have discussed extensively at this point, uh, probably you know, the, the best way to, to do it is through, well, so the easiest way to do it is just to have some sort of like universal coverage plan. Uh, if you, in the U.S., I think you know, they decide politically that would not be um, uh, having the government handle everything there uh, just wouldn't uh, be like politically feasible. So instead, what we have now, or we're moving toward, towards, is an insurance mandate where everybody is required to buy insurance. And of course, you know, traditionally we've also linked insurance to something that's unrelated to health. So in this particular case, or at least not strongly related to health. Uh, with asymmetric information on the uh, the sort of you know the side of the or in the, the context of doctors who know more about conditions than patients or insurers do, uh, one possibility certainly is to uh, sort of start paying doctors on a salary basis, as we mentioned with Kaiser, uh, then rather than paying them in sort of like a per procedure basis. Uh, now that doesn't you know there are sort of risks to that as well. Maybe if they're on a salary basis, they're just kind of like um, you know they'd rather just send a patient home and, and go home for the day, uh, since it's not going to technically change the amount of money that they're making. Uh, but uh, in general, I think it's that,
a lot of money into uh, into this field. Uh, so that's literally the government spending on research and development. Um, uh, but you would also sort of like it to be the case that essentially the government has some negotiation. Given the government is you know, putting a lot of funding into it, you would like the government to also have negotiating price or negotiating power over prices. So a uh, so single payer system would certainly uh, cause that to happen. Again, I think that's unlikely, but even say giving Medicare something more leverage or more latitude to negotiating prices would have a substantial impact. Okay, so um, so let me actually uh, pass out the um, evaluations. And then, so in theory, I don't know, Megan was supposed to have the, uh, the problem set for the last for the uh, PS5s. 